Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rifle Chair Channel. Today we're going to be doing a, a, a number four of the Anfield Teardown. And also what we're going to do is once we've got that rifle t torn down, we're going to kind of compare it to the different bedding systems used in different the Anfields. You know, different uh, genres of the number four Mark I, Mark II iterations. We're just going to compare the, the bedding systems for four different rifles. In this case it's going to be uh, number four Mark One T, which I've already got the the wood removed. It's going to be a number four Mark One Star that has been match bedded by a regimental armor. We're also going to uh, compare that just to your standard number four Mark Two, and we're going to compare uh, the bedding systems from a uh, an Enfield Enforcer as well. Uh, <clears throat> what makes them each a little bit different from one another, and why? Uh, uh, also, uh, I'm actually going to show you the teardown of a rifle as well because uh, it's going to be, just for no for sake of argument, it's going to be this one here, the uh, number 4 Mark 1 Star because uh, a lot of people are doing this wrong and you can actually damage your rifle if you don't tear down your rifle properly. And so I'm going to do my best to try and demonstrate that for you so you know how to do it properly without damaging uh, your stock. If you do it improperly, for example, prying the wood off the rifle from the forestock, you can actually get a longitudinal crack right here along in the receiver. Um, so we're going to try to avoid that, and so I'll show you, uh, I'll demonstrate for you how to do actually do a rifle teardown. I'm not going to be removing the uh, the butt stocks from these rifles. However, if you're going to be doing that, you're going to need a large flathead screwdriver, or maybe um, a ratchet with a flat with a flat blade uh, screwdriver tip um, on an extension. You should be able to do that. Uh, but uh, so let's, uh, a few other things to take into consideration when you're going to be doing a rifle teardown is to make sure you use the, the proper screwdriver. So get yourself a decent screwdriver kit. This one was, I don't know, it was like 20 bucks at Walmart or something to that effect and uh, another 10 bucks for spare tips because uh, you don't want to mar your screws. You don't. You, you want to treat. You know, there's certain. I should say tension. You want to have any screw. We'll talk about that a little bit. So you make sure you got a decent screwdriver kit. Don't use cheap screwdrivers for for working on your rifles. You're also going to want uh, containers to put screws, springs, um, parts and components. Keep them separate so you don't get them mixed up or they don't fall off the table and disappear into the grass or into the dirt. You know, having to do a rifle uh, disassembly and then reassembly and then lose parts is a huge pain in the ass. Let's try to avoid that, make sure we've got the right stuff. Um, also what you may want to have in your possession is a, is a, is a nice brush, something to this effect. And uh, <clears throat> I would also recommend uh, some raw linseed oil. This is raw or pure linseed oil and or boiled linseed oil. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but once you got the rifle apart, you might as well clean it out and give it another coat of oil. That's actually the reason why the number 4 Mark 1 T is apart right now, is because um, I'm rehydrating the wood with raw linseed oil, just on the inside of the, uh, the rifle. It had been, um, somebody had unfortunately used a varnish or shellac on the rifle. They didn't even remove it from the... Uh, the barreled action from the wood when they applied the varnish. They just this is a number four Mark One T. Okay, we use linseed oil for your Lee Enfields. We don't use varnish or varathene or anything like that. Um, so I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm going through a process of just rehydrating the wood and stabilizing it because it's uh, and it's soaking in the oil quite quite nicely, um, especially in the areas where the uh, I've gone through a process to remove the shellac, but I won't go into that right now. So let's get the camera reconfigured and we'll start to tear down. Okay, let's start with the uh, the long branch C number four Mark One Star. Now these uh, these action covers are great if you want to keep detritus out of your action. If you while you're carrying it through the bush, you don't need to have the rifle at the ready or for whatever reason you're just transporting it. I re highly recommend you consider acquiring one of these. These are great. That aside. Okay, let's make sure that the uh, is unloaded, and we are unloaded. Always ensure your rifle is unloaded before you start your disassembly process. 
Okay, so one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the trigger guard on this um, on this rifle. Well, actually, I'm going to remove the bolt. Okay. And for this, we're going to start with the action, the king screw, or the action screw. Some people call it the king screw. Uh, I just call it the action screw. Again, it's a nice big, this is a target sling swivel, as you can see. And they are a little bit different, and we'll talk about that later. There's good tension on there. Good. Okay, remove, <clears throat> replace the drill bit here, or the... Uh, Right there. Yeah, I got a right size right there. Got a really tiny screw for the trigger guard here. Should come out easily. Shouldn't be a uh, struggle. Okay, everything looks as uh, yeah. This, this rifle's definitely gotten wet. A little bit of corrosion here and there, so I'll have to clean that up later. Okay, now we're going to do the sling swivels. Change screw heads again. To start with the uh, the rear band. And I like to also uh, make sure that the screws stay with that part because they're, made, they're a mating pair, so I don't like to get the screws mixed up. But that's just me. I mean, it's probably not a big deal. But since these two screws are the same, take this thing out. This here obviously needs to be replaced. This, the uh, sling swivel here, so that's a part I'm going to replace because this, the peen on the part here is has lost its grasp of it so that part needs to be replaced that's almost you almost always see that some something's uh, not working like it should and you just give it a inspection yeah that's going to need some oil the uh, muzzle clamp as well not too bad. I do have a little bit of a crack in there though, which I didn't know about before. You need to stick something in there. Okay, yeah. We're making contact. You're going to want to look on your uh, on the barrel and uh, see where and if you're making contact on the uh, on the handguards. Um, a little bit of contact is fine. But if, but if you're not if you're not able to move your barrel around, um, well, actually, let's talk about that right now. I'm going to put this back in. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Again, this is why you don't lose parts. You need that washer. You, because this rifle has been match bedded, there is no um, action screw bushing on this one. This this rifle is fully flu free floated. Anyway, so the point is this: is that <clears throat> you want to try and have your your wood kind of in the in the center of the barrel channel. It shouldn't be making any firm contact anywhere along the sides of the barrel channel, but you do want to have some upward motion, like so. See that? You want to have about five pounds of four tip pressure on your rifle. Okay, this one here is free floated, so I'm not worried about it. But your conventional bedding system will not be. Okay, so let's get back to it here.
Now, when you try to remove barreled action from the stock, first of all, let's not lose these screws. Let's thread them on there, give them one or two threads, maybe three, just so they keep. Good. Now, like I said previously, you do not want to pull this off the stock from the muzzle end. Okay, you want to do this by kind of pushing it down at the receiver end, pushing the wood down at the receiver end. Just wiggle it back and forth until it goes pop. Like that. And you want to use both thumbs if you can on either side of the stock. nice and tight. That's the way I want it. There you go. It's looking good. Yeah, I'm going to clean this up. All right, let's get the other rifle out here and uh, do the same. There is a bushing, an action bushing right in here. You've got to make sure you don't lose that. It will try to escape. Trust me. Okay, where is it? There's a keeper on the other side of this action screw. I just stuck a little Stick it in the hole, um, it will eventually start to pop out, then you can just put your finger over it to hold it in place. Okay, don't lose this. Put it on right away. And these as well. Now 
Well, this should come off fairly easily. Yeah. Good. And what I like about the uh, the number four Mark II is the trigger is permanent is affixed to the receiver, which is a much better design for a consistent trigger pull. There's your bushing for the action screw. Okay, let's set this aside. Let's see if it'll come out without uh, dinking with it too much. We'll do the action screw first. bushing doesn't want to come out, that's alright, just watch it so it doesn't fall out and disappear into the toolies. Okay, and the hand guard screw. The front rear band, I guess, sorry. This Enforcer is uh, rifle number 360. It's got a 36 here. And I think an original pencil. This, this is for a rifle 481, wherever that is. Okay, and. Again, the Enforcer has the, uh, the Mark II action, and trigger is attached to the receiver as well. But it is much lighter and we'll talk about that. Okay, let's line up the stocks and uh, do a comparison. Okay, so up here we have the Enfield Enforcer um, number 4 Mark II as you can tell by the rear receivers uh, rear um, inletted areas of the stock right here uh, here we have the C number 4 Mark 1 star match bedded and here we have the number 4 Mark 1 T. Um, now if we actually look at the I wish the light was better in here that's not too bad. If we actually look down into there looks everything looks pretty darn conventional. If we look down into there 
is just a wee bit different. There we get a little bit of light down there. A little bit of light. Now you can see on the sniper that it's how much it's opened up. Okay, compared to the number four Mark One Star, the Canadian one, the hole is much just just big enough for that screw to get through, right? The number four is much bigger because it's it's got the target sling swivel on it. The same can be uh, said here. Here is the uh, where am I? Is that the ring? Yeah. So there's the number four Mark II, and there is the Enfield Enforcer. They're about the same actually. <clears throat> Contact areas, much more difficult to see it in the number four Mark I T, but the draws have very good contact. There's the draws there. That's where the rear of the receiver sits, because remember, there's only one action screw on these rifles, folks. This is essentially the rear action screw. And we got good good contact in this area here, all the way in the front here. We don't appear to have any real contact in the Knox form area. And we don't have any contact along the barrel channel until we get to here. Okay, so there's five pounds of foretip pressure. Uh, the barrel is pressing down on this location of the forestock for about five pounds of foretip pressure, pressing down. Because this thing, even though it's a sniper, it's not free floated. This is the bedding system for the number four of the infield. Okay, so we have contact here, contact here, contact here. Otherwise, there's no contact anywhere in this area. The match bedded rifle is, is free floated and is called center bedded. In this case, the rear of the action has been lifted just a tiny amount. I've, I did this, I replaced the original bedding that's on it. And you'll see that there's two dowels in these locations here. They were drilled through and they were making contact with the receiver here. But because of age, they've worn down. They weren't making the appropriate contact. And so I've basically bedded the contact areas at the rear of the receiver here. It's only raised slightly because if you raise it too much, it'll totally adjust your trigger pull. Then we get to here. We got good firm contact at this location. Right? That is wood at this location. There's no bedding compound here. Now, what I have done is, is this was originally uh, bedded by a regimental armorer for a shooting team. Uh, I don't know which regiment it was, but this here is the center block, which allows your barrel to be free floated because you've got to replace the contact area that I was at this location. There is no contact here on this rifle because it's a match rifle. Okay, Even though this is a sniper, it's got contact here. This is a match rifle. It's free floated. That contact bearing area is right here. Oops, right here. That's called the center block. And this is the original center block from when the regimental armor did it. And it is fiberglass and resin. This stuff, the fiberglass, is exactly the way it was, except I've, I've redone it with JB Weld. So we have firm contact here at the Knox form. We have good contact here at the wood. And it's stabilized on other, either side of the receiver at the action screw. And again, uh, contact at the rear as well. Okay, as we move to the number four Mark II, we have firm contact here in the draws. Firm contact here around the receiver. And you can actually see where the um, Sunkrite paint is making contact with the, with the wood stock of this location at the Knox farm. Not so much on the sniper though, but it's really hard to tell because it's got fresh oil on it. But and then all the way along the barrel channel, it's, we're making no contact at all until, again, we get to here, where we have our four to five pounds of four-tip pressure, just like the sniper. Now, the interesting part here is the uh, infield enforcer. Again, making firm contact here in the draws. We make our way forward. Really good contact at this location here. Really good contact. And also, this area right here. And now, this area has been adjusted. Somebody has Mickey Mouse around with this. This is probably a little bit proud. 
when it was um, when it came out of the factory. So I don't know. Maybe it was the police. This is the Scottish, Scottish National Police that had this rifle, and so they've they've manipulated this area. They've actually removed material, and then there's a bit of a raised area here. But the interesting part is no contact anywhere along the force dock. There is no contact. There is no third point of contact on the Enfield Enforcer, but it's also a heavy profile barrel. There's only contact at two locations. That is here, here, and here. That's it. Considering there's only one action screw, that's actually pretty interesting. On this side, um, yeah, we're making real firm contact there as well. You'll see that uh, there's a metal shim built into the enforcer at this location. Okay, it's recessed. It slides right in. That's your bedding surface. And you can really, really torque down on that, but uh, I don't I don't do that because I don't I want it to last. And so on. Interesting though, I'm gonna sneeze. No, maybe I won't. There is similarity between this and the C number four Mark I star, and I'll show you in just a minute. So what we're looking at here is the match tune C number four Mark I star here, and we have the Enfield Enforcer here. We've also got the mating surfaces of the trigger guard so that you can see them. Now what, what has happened here is um, um, the Canadian rifle here, this area has been cleaned out just a little bit and there's been a, a plate brazed, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, onto the top of the trigger guard to give it a much wider bearing area. Very similar in nature to the Enfield Enforcer right here with the metal plate. Okay, so it's a much broader bearing area, um, the, and and also this entire area right here, you can just make it out. You can just make out the resin, the fiberglass and resin, like a uh, how should we say, kind of like a pillar, pillar bedding. This area here is all fiberglass, it's, and it goes all the way down, and it's just the hole is just big enough to fit the screw, the action screw. Um, whereas on the on this one, the enforcer, um, it's intended to fit this on the inside. Okay, so that that goes in there, and it locks, and it locks in place. Okay, that's different from the uh, the way the the Canadian Armour did it. Uh, he just wanted a a fat bear, bearing area, and instead of crushing the wood. He's got a nice fat surface area of uh, fiberglass here, so you can really bear down on that screw and get it tight. There's the other side of the rifle, the enforcer's on top, the long branch uh, match tune free floated is on the bottom. Honestly, you know, they don't look that different, do they? They don't look that different. Basically the same kind of concept here. I always got a chainsaw running in the background where I live. Anyhow, here you can see the uh, C number 4 Mark 1 star match tuned, free floated, Enfield Enforcer, number 4 Mark 1 T, and your conventional number 4 Mark 2. You can look at the difference in the, sh in the uh, right over the action screw. We got firm contact on here. We can note I have pretty darn good contact at the bottom here, but there's not a lot of contact here on the sides for the enforcer. Same with the, uh, the sniper, which you, sorry, you can't see that great. And um, over here, the number four Mark II. Lots of material here though, and if you actually compare the, the long branch, which is actually, been, this is mated to the actual metal. Um, if you actually look at it, I mean, there's there's not your material would start right around here if you wanted to have firm contact right around the front of your action screw. So that's a little bit different. With the Knox form here, good contact. It's not entirely even. This was kind of an emergency bedding job I had to do because I was going to a national competition and I needed to get this. The bedding was no good. I had to refurbish it. Here's the uh, sniper in the uh, number 4 Mark 1T and the number 4 Mark 2 on the right. 
and four Mark One T's on the left. The uh, I will say though the uh, this is a BSA quality of the uh, the inletting on on this uh, Mark One T is nowhere near as smooth or as nice as the as the beet. This is English walnut. This here is beech. Um, the enforcer is also beech, and this here is black walnut. Cork, um, yeah. But in all cases, with the exception of the center block here on the C number four mark one star, the exception of this rifle, because it's the only one here that's free floated. Well, this one is too, but it doesn't need a center block because it's a heavy barrel, I guess. But um, in all of these cases, with the exception of the center block here, the barrel channels are fairly. There's no contact anywhere along them, until of course we get to this location here. And the sniper and the number four mark two, we got good contact here, and no contact here. And the and the Canadian rifle. You should also not have any contact up against the the wrist anywhere in this area. You should not, uh, and if you do, it should just barely be touching. Um, any of these rifles, there should be no contact anywhere near. So what you can do is you oil it up, oil up your metal, and see if you've got any much in the way of contact here. Or you can you can just you know paint it with something and see where it's contacting. You're just going to shave those areas down just a little bit. You'd expect to see um, kind of some some black. You expect to see some black. If you're making contact here, you can, there's probably a bit of contact maybe right there, but in the number four mark too. You're always going to want to these inspector draws. Make sure they're not cracked or or mushroomed or the wood's been damaged in any kind of way. You can see firm contact here on the enforcer. There and there. There is firm contact there. It's just difficult to see because it's oily. And the number four mark one two. Number four mark one T there could maybe we have a bit of a problem there. I'm not too sure, but it looks like it's actually making contact. The Australians came up with it with an ingenious solution to damaging the draws because this area is in, under such tension. What they did was they actually put a brass shim and a screw that goes in so that uh, it's a little bit more difficult for you to damage the draws. I'm not sure if that's better or not, but I've I've never seen damaged Australian SMLA draws. It's the same in the number four mark one, three, right? They both have the same kind of bedding system there. That looks messy. And it was an emergency bedding job just to get me up and running. But hell does it work. Man, this thing is an accurate rifle, which is which is a bit of a surprise considering it's got about five inches of really terrible throat erosion. It still shoots super accurate. A bit of a fouling problem, mind you. So that's it, folks. A bunch of Lee Enfields, parts and pieces everywhere, but everything is orderly. The chaos is nowhere near as bad as it might look. But uh, I'm going to rehydrate some of the wood here with some raw linseed oil, including this enforcer stock. And, and uh, so I'm going to get to work on that right now. Hope you guys are all doing great. Hope you enjoyed the video. It's kind of interesting how people have found different solutions to achieve you know, different names and so on, but uh, there's a little bit of variability in the bedding systems of the Lee Enfield. You just kind of kind of know which which aspect or what kind of quality it is that you're looking for in your rifle. I don't. I'm not an advocate for for bedding your rifles. There's absolutely nothing wrong with I'd say probably 90% of the bedding in most people's rifles. If you don't have four tip pressure like you're supposed to, you maybe somewhere along the barrel channel you've got contact where you shouldn't have it. It's all going to affect you, the accuracy of your rifle. Uh, however, what I do know is that uh, uh, rifles that were issued to the typical infantry soldier, there was only so much that they were allowed to do the, to their rifles to make them accurate. Okay, so they, they were supposed to be used with a bayonet. That's why they have four-tip pressure. 
um, all this different kind of different stuff. They weren't match rifles, and so they weren't allowed to modify or accurize their rifles. Um, I recommend that you don't either, because that could conceivably affect the um, the the value of your rifle. If you uh, some of these rifles are terribly expensive now, if you go dinking around with the bedding on these things, you could actually be damaging or devaluing your rifle, and you don't want to do that. Uh, so. Uh, so just use some common sense and be careful and uh, and uh, also I should say is that uh, armors what they would do is they would actually chisel or drill away um, wood where and where needed and then they would um, replace with a block of wood you know so for whether it was replacing the draws uh, they'd uh, they use little tiny dowels and stuff like that and glue to hold things in place so they weren't using epoxies and and so on. They're re they're just re reestablishing uh, the contacts and the draws and so on using wood. That's what they used to do. So they weren't doing like what you've seen here in this match rifle that was done by a regimental armor, free floating and stuff like that. They were just restoring its uh, field readiness. Cheers, folks. Great maple leaf. Up.